Good morning and welcome to church. Welcome to the house of prayer. Welcome to the house of the living God. Welcome to the house of miracles. Welcome to his presence. Welcome. In Psalms 100 states, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to him. He is our God. And I want to encourage you to come in with thanksgiving and prayer or in praise and just worship the living God and worship the reason why we're alive today. Worship the reason why there's breath inside of the lungs because he gave that same breath to us. He gave that very breath to us. And please don't let this moment be able to pass you by. Just shout with praises. Be thankful for it. But it's not just how loud you could get and how much you can move. It's how sincere you really are. Because the story of that woman that, that, that needed healing and Jesus is walking through a crowd and that crowd is loud and people are shouting trying to get to his attention but it doesn't bother him it doesn't even sway him but the moment this woman touched the clothing and the edge of his robe and he's like what just happened now that's what I believe is when you come into the the gates with true thanksgiving is that you understand that there is no other source of your joy your peace your healing your your just your messiah is jesus and we need to come with that kind of authentic appreciation devotion that love and that desire to be able to touch the living god ourselves Let's all just stand and just get the atmosphere so ready and be able to welcome in the presence of God and let the Holy Spirit be able to move. So today we'll be able to just receive what the Lord has given us. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done so far. And Lord, we just stand here in awe, waiting for your glory to be even more magnified. Lord, let it be able to be more real to us. Let it be so tangible we could touch it, Lord. Let us, Father, not be able to just dis, uh, uh, just let it sway by, Jesus. Let us jump out for it, Father. Let us give a praise for your kingdom. Hallelujah, Jesus.
your words unstoppable all things are possible in you let's sing it again church God of abundantly more than we ask or think Lord you will never fail your name is powerful your words unstoppable all things are possible
thank you, Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're on our side, God, that you're a faithful Father. And right now, we just want to come before you the way we are, with our open hearts, God, and just worship you and fellowship with you, Lord. We want to speak the name of Jesus today in this place over every single person. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Addiction starts to breathe. Wherever we are in life, 
We just need Jesus. We need Jesus in our families. We need Jesus in our marriage. We need Jesus in our work life. There's nothing that we can do without Jesus. He did so much for him so we can be free. So let's just acknowledge that name and declare this name over everything. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I lived in the times when Jesus was here on this earth there were so many miracles signs and wonders everything and we really don't see that today so I wish I lived at that time but you know the truth is that Jesus is inside of us come on church let's get excited for this the Holy Spirit lives within you lives within me lives within your neighbor and we don't need to have a physical Jesus because we have the spiritual Jesus inside of us. So there are more signs and wonders, more miracles that we need to access in this time because Jesus is here. He is here right now. And if you have a prayer that's in your heart, if you're looking for a miracle, if you're just looking for Jesus, if you're looking for his presence, just close your eyes and worship him right now. Just praise him. If you need a special prayer with anointing, you can come up to the front. We have ministers available. But the presence of God is so thick in this place. Don't let the moment pass you by. Because truly, we might not ever have this opportunity again. We could leave here and not know. Really, God is the only one that knows our path, that knows where we're gonna wind up when leaving here. So if this is the time that you need Jesus, just run to Jesus. Because he's waiting with arms wide open. <laughs> Jesus, we lift up your name right now. We lift up your name for our neighbor. 
We lift up your name for our church, for our city, for our region. Jesus, we need a miracle. We need a miracle of your presence. We need healing. We need a revival, God, in this region. So we cry your name. Jesus, we call upon you to break every stronghold. We call upon your name to be over every principality. We call upon your name to break every boundary, to break every chain, to break every wall, God. The barriers that we have built between you and us, Lord, we want them to crumble. We just want your presence to be so thick in this place, Lord. We shout your name, Jesus, the name that is strong to move the mountains, the name that is strong to change everything, to heal any incurable disease, anything, Jesus, we just call upon your name. We call upon your name, Lord. Let us walk in that inheritance that you have provided for us. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, just come upon this church. Let your presence just drop like a curtain in this place, Lord, over every heart, over every mind, Lord. We pray for the renewal of the mind. We pray for mental healing, Jesus. We pray for healing of our hearts, God. If we have any offenses, if we have any hurts, Jesus, we just lay them at your feet today. We lay them before you, Jesus, today in this place. And we proclaim that you are victorious. And because you have that victory, we have that victory over every sin, over every darkness in our life. God, we worship your name. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. Church, we continue to move in worship as we move into the offering. So many times we talk about how the service of offering is just a continuation of worship because you're just showing your affection to God. You're putting your faith in the Lord. You're putting your trust in the Lord. You know, Solomon was the most wise man, right? He asked God for the greatest wisdom and he offered and tithed so much. He just brought so many burnt offerings, everything that he could. So if the wisest man on earth was doing that, you know, let's follow in his example. There's a portion of scripture um, I was reading. It's in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. You know, God ch is challenging us in this scripture. He says, bring all your tithes, bring everything, bring whatever you brought to me. Whatever I gave you, give that back to me and in turn, test me. Test me and see what I will provide for you. Enough that there will be no place for all the blessings that I have given you. So church, let's be faithful in the scripture today. Let Jesus check our faith and in turn, he wants to be testing himself and see how faithful we are so we can see how faithful he is. As the ushers come up, we will pray. Jesus, we lay down our offerings and our tithes to you, God. We want to have faith, Lord that you are going to do what you need to do with these, Lord. No matter what it is, if it's going to the orphanages or if it goes to repairs or whatever it is, Lord, we want to have faith and trust in you that you will provide, that you will overflow this house, Lord, that there will be not even room for us to keep all the blessings, Jesus. We proclaim the scripture to be evident in our lives, Jesus. We proclaim that we live this scripture, everything that we pray, God, that it is not just empty prayer or beautiful words Lord but we want it to come from the bottom of our hearts with meaning Jesus we worship you Lord we honor you in this place God amen amen Slava come up as church you can be seated hallelujah welcome to Grassland every every everyone and I want to welcome everyone who is watching online as well and we love you, we pray for you, that one day you're going to be here. Amen. I want to do a few announcements right now. This Saturday, April 9 at 9 a.m. So it's so easy to remember, 9 at 9. 
Amen. <laughs> We're going to do the spring cleaning. And uh, so if you have uh, some cleaning supplies, uh, I would encourage you to bring it. It's going to be a lot of fun time. It's a good time to do the cleaning and uh, have a good fellowship all together. So I just want to invite all of you this Saturday. Uh, tonight, uh, we will have a special service. Tonight, we'll, we'll have a choir. Um, and um, 78 people, that are going to be coming tonight. And uh, they need to be hosted overnight. And lots of people, they already volunteered. Thank God. Praise God. And we need to host 11 more people. Okay, so if you can open your home, just please come and talk to me. And we can um, add some people. God, he calls us to be hospitable, to hospitality. Amen. Amen. And uh, right now, I want to introduce our special guest speaker for today. Come on. Hallelujah. You're going to be blessed today. And uh, C.S. Uh, Robinson, he is working for the college students in the Boston area. And uh, Pastor C.S., uh, I call him C.S., Louis the second. <laughs> He's working among the young people. That's our future generation. Those are our future politicians, our future, future presidents, uh, uh, future businessmen. And uh, I just want to encourage all the parents today. If you have your kids who are going to Boston or in Boston area or any other area to colleges, just Stay after the service and uh, talk to see us. He can help you to make a connections with the small groups. If you plan to go or if you're going to school or you plan to go to the school as well, I would encourage you to talk to him so he can connect with the Christian Assemblies of God, home-based small groups because we need the fellowship. Amen. And now I want to introduce uh, see us to the stage. And uh, let's welcome him. Thank you. And if you, in the f uh, first few minutes, please talk a little bit more about the ministry. Absolutely. I have a mic on. Thank okay. you. <laughs> hey, good morning. Morning. Man, what a wonderful worship. Thank you, worship team, for that great time. Praise the Lord and good morning. Grateful. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be here. Pastor Alexander, thank you for inviting and having Pastor Slava. And Sister Lillian, what an honor to be here today. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity. I would like to take a few minutes just to say who I am. And to then also would like to take maybe a few more minutes to say what I do. And then to get to the word where God has, God might speak to us today. Just like Sister was saying, the presence of God is really in this place. Amen. Amen. I am a son I'm the oldest among the sons to my father, and I'm a husband. My wife's name is Faith, and uh, she's not here, of course, and I'm a father to three little girls. They are eight, five, and four, Sarah, Mercy, and Eliana. People say, I do live in a house full of women. You're right, and it's been fun. It's been great. So that's, that's who I am, and what I do is I have the opportunity to to serve Jesus in the city of Boston, um, what I do is to live life with young men so that they can walk with Jesus and be disciple who makes disciples who make disciples until Jesus comes back. So I will tell you a story. 20, 2009, I was in Texas, of course. Uh, that's where I'm from. I'm from Texas, moved to Massachusetts, Boston area about a an year and a half. And... Uh, I was there on campus one day. I met this guy named Johnny. Johnny's from Taiwan. He's coming from a well-established home, uh, but he is religious but not spiritual. He would say, I'm a, I would call myself a secular Buddhist, is what he said. So he was sitting in front of the, on this bench in front of the international building, and he said, well, I met him, and I said, hey, how is it going? What, what, what you're up to? Then he said, well, I'm waiting here to... to to meet my friends from Japan, then we are supposed to go to Walmart to get me a bike, but they did not show up. That's okay, I have all the time in the world. So, so I got him and we went to Walmart, to get, we got him a bike, 
And uh, afterwards, about after three hours, I dropped him off at the dorm. And then he said, can we meet tomorrow? And that was the beginning of a friendship that started that day. And I had the opportunity to see him walking out of the aisle in the church where we gathered, giving his life to Jesus after eight months. What Johnny found, it did not stop with him. He went and found a guy named Yuya from Japan. It's the same guy he was waiting on. He found him, and he led him to the Lord. Five years after, he went to London to do his MBA, and two years after that, I had the privilege to go to Taiwan to do his wedding. So I was there doing his wedding, and, the, and I was there four days, and as he was coming back to America, he said, hey, I didn't get to tell you this. My brother came to the Lord, and my mom started to go into church. What I want to tell you is the journey is the first and his family to came to the Lord. That is years of this, uh, you know, this, this troubled life came to an end with Johnny. And then because of him, his brother came to the Lord and his mother just started loving Jesus. So when we say university campuses are the most strategic mission field, it is not rhetoric. It truly is the most strategic mission field that exists. Boston alone, there are 35 campuses, 152,000 students in six mile radius. And I, I guarantee you can see all sorts of people in that place. I sometimes I actually tell this to my friends that there is, it, it is very likely that you would run into a walk, you may run into the Sultan of Saudi Arabia on the streets of Boston, that in Riyadh itself. <laughs> because people send their the best to the city of Boston. And we live there, so we consider it as a privilege to be part of what God is doing. God has been doing. Hey, we didn't come to change, the bo change Boston because of what we brought. Of course not. God has been doing so many good things. We just want to see how we can partner with what God is already doing. How you can be partners. You can, you can do three things. One, pray for revival. It is the church of God. It is, it is our responsibility to cry to God, O oh Lord, send your Holy Spirit again. We should cry for that, not just for Boston. I think you should cry, cry that over your family. You should cry that over your neighborhood. You should cry that over Springfield. Amen. Amen. Think about it. If God's Spirit shows up in Springfield, game over. We should, we should cry. So how you can be part of it? You can pray for Boston. You can pray for all the students that come to America. Number two is pray for relationships to be formed. At the moment, as you can imagine, Boston is a place where the, uh, the university does not want us to be in the university. Only, okay? they, they don't want us to be there. They were thinking, well, we are private schools. You know, we are here to train the best of the students, and we don't want you to come into our school and uh, disciple people. So access to campus is not easy. You can be praying, Lord, open doors for these people so that you will, you will glorify your name. So you can be praying for that. And third is resources, that God will open doors to, to continue the work he has started. Amen. I always think this, that God, when revival happens, when relationships, when relationships been formed, resources comes about itself. Right? So you can be praying for that. That would be great. So... With that being said, I would, like to, I would like to jump into the word God has given us. God has been speaking to my heart this morning. I had a great drive here, and I drove about an hour, 45 minutes. But this is amazing because, and this was not in the plan like three, three days ago. But then it's like, and, and I'm thinking, about well, this is a much, must, uh, much needed time for me. I had a good time in the car praying. The presence of God was there. I'm just crying. Oh, what's going on? So it was, I had a good time with the Lord on the drive here, so thank you again for the invitation. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you please turn with me to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11 through 18. Nehemiah chapter 11, chapter 2, sorry, chapter 2, verse 11 through 18. I will read from ESV. <clears throat> so I, Nehemiah, went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, 
and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There has no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring, to the dung gate, and inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were break down, broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Verse 14. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Verse 15. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I returned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Verse 8, 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burnt. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I, I told them of the land of my God that had been upon the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. I have mentioned to you about three girls that I have. Sarah is my oldest daughter. She is seven, year, seven years old. She's kind, she's smart, she's fun, and also she's a rule follower. Of course, now you think, of course, the oldest ones generally are the rule followers. Along with her love for princesses, Anna, and Indian curries, she also loves neatness and orderliness in her room. She enjoys keeping her precious things in order. She knows where her things were kept. One of the other things that is very important to her is she would make her bed in the morning every single day and she makes sure that it has been kept well throughout the day. This is a daily routine that she really enjoys. However, one day, her little sisters, Mercy and Ella, feeling a little creative when, her, when their older sister was not home. So they thought, well, how about this? How about we just make a mess out of her bed by the time she gets back from school today? So, and Mercy and uh, Ella thought it was so hilarious and that would be such fun thing to do. So that day, when Sarah gets home after school, she sees her little sisters made a mess out of her bed. And she was so frustrated, mad, and started crying. I meant she started sobbing. Sarah felt so mad. She made, Sarah felt made fun of. Her orderly life seemed to be shattered. And she was so mad at her little sisters, and of course they reconciled eventually, but Sarah fixed her bed, and there was calm, and that was the end of that episode. See, I would say this is not just Sarah's story. It is a type of all of our stories. Don't we all find things that are precious being broken? Lives of people who are close to us being broken. And this morning, God sees your brokenness and he is present in your brokenness. He is not only sees and being present in it, but he helps us to see through the broken things and invites us to engage in the work of building. A friend of mine who came from China recently, and I met him in September, and uh, this guy, man, he has been so hungry for Jesus. And uh, as we were walking in, on campus the other day, he said, see, yes, I heard this. I remember this now. When God closes a door, we are not supposed to sit in front of the door and cry. We are supposed to get up and look around. He must be opening a window somewhere else. I'm just like, and then you said you're not a Christian? So we are the people called to engage in the work of rebuilding with God. Broken things are everywhere in our lives. But, but God is looking into people who is willing to get up and start building with him. So today's sermon, the title is Seeing Through the Broken Walls. 
Now, when you get ready to hear a sermon from this particular passage we just read, it is only natural for us to think about and anticipate what the sermon is going to be about. We instantly started to think about the condition of a broken situation, right? That could be either personal or communal or familial or maybe even national. Or we instantly started to think about a sense of calling in our own lives to stand up and rebuild. And a sense of resilience takes over us. But today, this morning, it is my hope that he would look at that, that you will look at this passage with an anticipation from the Holy Spirit to talk to you, to talk to us, and that we will be people of action, taking responsibility according to what God is going to talk to us. We are people who call to do things with the Lord. What makes us different from the world is that we have Jesus with us and we cannot walk past a need that we saw. We are people of responsibility. Let me tell you the context of this passage. Babylon, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, came in and overthrew Jerusalem and Judah. The Babylonians take the Jews, the captive, and deport them from Judah to Babylon starting 579 BC. The glory of Judah is extinguished. The capital city, Jerusalem, is overtaken. The temple is destroyed. The people are deported. And for the next 70 years, Judah will remain in this particular broken state. By the time we get to this particular passage, exiles who were taken at the time of the Babylon invasion had already been allowed to return to their homeland. And the ones that did had already came, they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. But here, Nehemiah finds out the walls and gates are not been rebuilt. Just the temple has been rebuilt. Now you might ask, so what is the big deal about these walls you're talking about here? Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 3 says this, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame because the walls and the gates were broken. You see, for Israelites and Nehemiah, rebuilding the broken walls and gates were a matter of security and glory. Rising up and building these broken walls mean building toward the promises God has given them years ago. And I wonder this morning if anybody sitting here thinking that the enemy stolen the promises God has given you. That the enemy destroyed the walls, the security, the honor God has placed over your life. Let me tell you this morning though, the God has orchestrated today to send me here to tell you this. The enemy does not get to keep you in exile for a long time. He does not get to keep you a slave a long time. If you men and women here at the Cross Light Church ready to rise up and start rebuilding the broken places, see God will come through you. He will come alongside and work with you. Amen. See, God cannot come your side and help you if you're not willing to do the work and already doing what you're able to do. Does that make sense? When I look at my daughter, Sarah, I, I just want to help her. I want to help her fix things, but I, I so want her to move herself and go to the broken place and start working on herself. That makes her feel, okay, she wants, she wants this thing to be fixed. And she is trying so hard to get this done. And she is able to do to some degree. And now I would like to get up and actually go help her to get this thing done. God is there to help you, but God expects us to start working on the broken places in our life by ourselves so that he come, can come alongside and work with us. Thousands of years ago, Nehemiah burdened about the broken walls and the broken gates of the city of Jerusalem for the sake of his own people. He did what it took to secure his people's safety and glory of his nation Israel. And God gave him victory. The question is, so what, CS? What's the big deal? 
What is it that the Lord is speaking to me and to you today in our context? About our personal lives, about our homes, about Springfield, about Boston, about New England. What is God talking to you today? See, it is our burden to rebuild the broken walls and the gates of our community. The broken walls and gates being the spiritual decay of our nation. Lack of moral strength of our nation. We can go down that path and saying the wall of justice is broken. The wall of mercy is broken. The wall of equality is broken. The wall of human dignity is broken. It seems so many important things that gives you and me security and a sense of belonging. A sense of belonging is broken. But the question is now. It's not what needs to be fixed in our context. The answer to that is obvious, right? We can name them, right? If we were to ask him, what are the things that are broken in our community or maybe in a family, in our nation, all you have to do is, you know, scroll through your Instagram page and find out the things that are broken in the world. So we are aware of what is broken in the world. But I think the important thing that we need to ask this morning is, where do we start building it? Where do we start rebuilding those broken things? Sometimes we are too much concerned about what is going on in this world and not seem to be concerned about the broken walls and gates in our own lives. Let me tell you this, church. All good work that I hope for in my family, in my church, and in my city, they must start in my own lives. I cannot dream of an America that's godly if I'm not godly. Do you see? If I cannot, I cannot, I cannot dream of a, of a student fellowship that is godly if I am not godly. All the things that we dream about, all the godliness that we desire and dream about, they must start in my own life. Amen. I would say, Nehemiah has been wounding the walls of his own life through all that is going on. The walls are broken everywhere. But Nehemiah worked on building the wall in his own life. The walls that would protect his heart and soul from the attacks of the enemy. The walls that would secure his heart from drifting away from his Lord Yahweh. Let us ask this. What are the things that God wants us to build in our own lives? That we will be people of God who build the brokenness of our home, our neighborhood, and our town. I think we can learn from the walls of Nehemiah has been already been building in his own life all along. This is something that we need to understand. What God does in you, he wants to do it through you. But I need to let God work in my life first so that I can, I can t- be turned into a channel that God can work through me. But somehow we are, I'm included, we are more concerned about what God can do through me, right? Instead of what God can do in my own life. But that is never the way God works. We go to the book of Genesis when God calls Abraham. Abraham, get out of your tent and come. Come, let me show you. You say that you, you don't have children. That's your right, you don't have children. But let me show you. Get out of your tent and look. Look, can you number the stars. No, he cannot. Then go, and then God uh, promises Abraham. And then what he says, and you will be a blessing. See, for every promise, whatever God gives you, I cannot be the end of it. At the very moment when I receive it, I turn into a channel. Right? At the very moment I receives it, I turn it into a channel. I let God go through that me. So what were the three? So I would say there were three different walls Nehemiah has been building in his own life that gave him the capacity when God looked at him, man, he has been working on this thing. I am going to use this man to build the walls that is broken across Jerusalem. God picks people who are already working on the things that they have been given. What is the number one thing that he was working on? Chapter 1, verse 4, he says this. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. What news are we talking here? It says, as soon as I heard these words, what news? The news about the broken walls and the broken gates, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Question, who do you call first? Or who do you run to first 
when you hear a news that is discouraging and that is disappointing? Just think. Who do you run to? Who do you go to? Definitely not to the person whom you have not talked for years. <laughs> Definitely not, right? So we go to the person whom we trust the most. Who is Nehemiah going to? Nehemiah is running to God. It's crazy, right? This is the point here. Nehemiah had a real intimacy with the Lord. The wall of real intimacy with Jesus, he has been building that for years. Psalms 27 verse 4, we read this, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Hey, we need to have intentional time spent with Jesus. This is point number one. Nehemiah had a real intimacy with God. How do we create that? How do we have this intentional time? How do, we cre- how do we have this real devotional life with Jesus? Reading scriptures, singing praises to him in private, listening to him, talking to us, praying just extravagant time with Jesus. It is time for us to start building the wall of intimacy with Jesus in our personal lives. It is in the practice of real extravagant time with Jesus that our hearts learn to know him personally, to listen to his voice and trust him. See, our problem is that we know the capacity of Jesus, but we don't have a real understanding of his character. We know the capacity of Jesus. What do, what do I mean by that? We understand what God can do. He can move mountains, right? We can heal us. We understand the strength and capacity of God, but we're not so sure about his character. And that is because what, does, what he does is not... Hey, how many of you know that? How many of you know that this dream job that you prayed for, it didn't come through, right? Right? If I only know the capacity of God, the God can do everything. If you don't get the job, what do you think? We can simply say, oh, it was not the will of God. Yeah. Right? But how do you understand the character of God in the midst of that? The character of God is, it comes only, we understand them by spending time with him. So this is important. Since the beginning of humankind, devil has never told a truth to convince human beings of anything. Instead, he had always used twisted truths to confuse God's children. Meaning, devil's idea is not to convince you of things because he cannot, but confuse you of truth. Devil is not telling you any different truth. He is just confusing you of the truth you already know. Because right theology matters. Why, why right theology matters? Because your understanding of what God determines the decisions that you make in life. We need to have deep convictions about what God is like, what he thinks of things that we think about. We need to have an understanding of how justice is explained in the scriptures, how freedom is explained in the scriptures, how relationship is explained in the Bible, what is mercy according to Jesus. We need to understand all these things. We know them by walking with Jesus, by choosing to spend time with God. We cannot afford to live in a world that, that ideas and propagandas and, you know, shapes our theology. The way we think that leads to choices, we cannot just have that. We cannot just keep taking things from the media, from all the things that we give our attention to. But when we don't turn our heart to Jesus, the first wall that we need to build in our life is to have intentional time spent with the Lord. I want to challenge you. I just hope that all of you, I, I believe that, and I know that you have a copy of the Bible. Have a Bible. Write it down. Read them and write it down. Mark it down. Just, just hear from the Lord every day. 
intentional time spent with Jesus is the foundation for all the efforts that is rewarding and lasting. The, effort, the works that we do must be originated from the heart of God. All that we do with so much passion must be an overflow of this overflowing well, the intentional time spent with Jesus. Nehemiah had a real relationship with God. He had a real intimacy with God. And that is the reason why he went to God and spent time with him when he heard the, the bad news. Point number two, Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 18, we read this. And I told them, verse 16 says, The Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the hand of my God that had been mean upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Nehemiah calls everybody and tells them what the Spirit of God has already been talking to him and the presence and the direction of God he has been sensing. And the response was what? Everybody said, let us rise up and build. So the response was not, I don't know if I believe what you are saying, or I don't know if I trust you, or I don't know if I want to be part of rebuilding. But the response was what? Was what? Let us rise up and rebuild. What does it indicate to you? For example... Your pastor stands up and tells you, hey, God spoke to me. Right? When pastor says that, everybody says, let's rise up and rebuild. What does that mean? That means that you trust your pastor. <laughs> That's exactly what it means. The response of the people to Nehemiah's sharing of what God spoke to him tells you that he had trust among his brothers. This is crucial in our times. Real relationship with one another really matters. A real relationship with one another really matters. Nehemiah had that among his people. Lesson number two, Nehemiah had real relationship or trust among brothers in his community. Nehemiah has been building the wall of real relationship in his community. This is the key to Christian walk in our daily lives, that we need one another. We need one another. We won't make it without each other. Do you know there are two sacraments that is cardinal to Christian faith? What are those? You can answer that. Baptism, right? And the second one is communion. Do you know we cannot do either of those without a person? See, this is the community is very central to what we believe. We need to fight for each other. We need to love one another. It is time for us to see through the broken walls called fake relationships. It is time for us to intentionally and sacrificially love one another. Jesus said, the world will know that you are my disciple when you love one another. We need to love one another like Jesus loved. What kind of love Jesus poured out on our behalf? What kind of love is that? It was a kind of unselfishly choosing for the highest good of the other. That is the kind of love Jesus did. Unselfishly choosing for the highest good of the other. That is the kind of love Jesus showed to his disciples and expressed for all his life. And that is the kind of love Jesus is asking us to do. Let me tell you this. More than 50% of all American families are broken. All American families, 55% of them are broken. Yeah, you guys have understand this, but make sure that our church, Crosslight Church in Springfield, continue to be a family for the lost and the broken in our community. The people out there, you know, I, I work among college kids, and I, man, some of the stories that you hear that you actually wonder, is this? Is this a real story or, or just, just not, just lying? <laughs> Stories are so bad. We live in a place that's so broken and God is asking us to build a wall of real relationship with one another. That when somebody walks into that room and they felt like, I felt the presence of God and I'm going back, there's Jesus in the community. 
Nehemiah chapter 3, the whole chapter talks about how different people serving together as a family and army finishing the task. It is in real relationship with, with others in godly community that we begin to learn to serve in one accord as we passionately serve our King Jesus. This is why real relationship matters. It matters because in real relationship with one another in a community is critical or crucial for personal spiritual maturity and advancement of the kingdom of Jesus. There are two things happens in a community, in a godly community, that we become more like Jesus. Some of us think that, you know, I become more like Jesus when I have in my, in my closet with my Bible. Of course, that is your personal devotional time to the Lord. But for us to be mature spiritually, we need to live in a community and let people speak into our lives and have a real relationship. And in that, we trust one another. Nehemiah had that trust among his brothers. Nehemiah had that trust among his brothers. Point number three, Nehemiah chapter two, verse three to five, it says this. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's, Grace lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. This is the key here. You sent me to Judah to the city of my father's graves that I may rebuild it. Point number three, Nehemiah has been building the wall of real responsibility. Real responsibility. Ever since Nehemiah heard the walls of Jerusalem was broken, he had been burdened and wanting to go build. Say, what is responsibility? If somebody were to ask you what is responsibility, the the simplest answer we have is always this. Knowledge equals responsibility. If you know it, then now you're responsible for it. As simple as that, right? Knowledge is responsible. Responsibility. We are responsible for what we know. Me and you. To Jesus primarily and to others. So when God looks at you, he actually, he can see my heart and he knows what I know. That's why we're going to lie to him. Do you understand? Because he can see through my heart and my mind. He knows what I know. And then he looks at me and tells me, see, yes, you know this, but have you been doing it? It's as simple as that. So knowledge equals responsibility. Church of Jesus cannot afford irresponsible people, but Jesus called us to be salt and light of this world. Amen. He sends us out as responsible people. And this is very important in our lives. It could be this wall of real responsibility that is broken in your life today. See, but I have moved into my spirit to tell you, People of God, you guys, this Jesus has given you enough strength to take responsibility and make decisions, and He has got you back. Come on. When God asks you to do something, when God shows you a need, when God is telling your heart to, to do something about it, He's He's not just okay, you go do yourself. No, He is asking you to do as soon as you start making the moves, He comes and helps you to get it done. Maybe the Spirit of God is talking to you at this moment and giving you an invitation to take responsibility in your personal life today. To take responsibility to strive to be the man of God that he desires of you. To take responsibility to strive to be the women of God that he desires of you. Worship team can come forward. This is something that Alexander McLaren said, the men who have been raised up to do great work for God. And the men have always begun by greatly and sadly feeling the weight of the sins and sorrows which they are destined to remove. No man will do worthy work at rebuilding the walls who has not been wet of the ruins. Real responsibility 
is what God calls us to do. If you're feeling the weight of your sin and sorrow of your situation, this is good. Why? Because Jesus is going to help you and heaven rejoices as you take real responsibility to remove it from your own life. It is only the man with a crushing sense of burden and responsibility whom God can trust with his work. If you don't have a heart that is burdened with an overwhelming sense of conviction, it will be impossible to be fruitful in the service of the Lord, says Alan Radpath. Responsibility is very important for us to serve Jesus. Not just doing what you can, not just doing so you can say, I have done my part, but doing with everything you have, with all the things you have, with all your heart, with all your mind, that is called spiritual responsibility. We are to be people who set standard for what does it mean to be responsible people. That is the calling we have. That is what Jesus is looking when he's looking at his disciples. Hey, God is calling at you, looking at you and calling you people responsible to you today. I can say that you have been people responsible. You have been a light in this, in this town. You have been. And praise the Lord for what you've been doing. But continue to take responsibility for God's lost lamb. So let's take responsibility for what to God matters to God the most. What, ma- what is that matters most to God? What do you think? It is his children that really matters to him. So let us take responsibility for his lost children in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. Remember, what God has done in you, he wants to do it through you. If if you remember one thing from today, it would be this. What God has done in you, he wants to do it through you. So this is the point here. God trusts his work with a man who has a great sense of responsibility. We learned three things from Nehemiah's life today. Nehemiah was a man of intimacy with God. He was a man of real relationship and trust in his community. And he was a man of real responsibility. Let me say that one more time. He was a man of real intimacy with God. Nobody can do that for you. Nobody can do that. I have to get up. I have to run to Jesus every day. Nobody can make me do that. Real intimacy with God and real trust, real love for one another. Nobody can do that for you either. You have to do it. And real responsibility that you walk in thinking away. Praise the Lord. What can, how can I serve Him well today? Looking for a need so that He can meet. Let us become people of real intimacy with God, people of real relationship with, uh, with one another and people are responsible. When all these come together, I believe we will see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our own lives, in our families, and in our cities. Nehemiah is a type of Jesus. He's not the one we follow. We follow Jesus, our King. It is Jesus that we follow. It is no Nehemiah. Jesus is still our model that we follow, and He is our real hero. Jesus, we read that while he was on this earth, had a great intimacy with the Father. Jesus gave his life for me and you. And he took initiative to have real relationship with us. And Jesus took the ultimate responsibility on his shoulder for the sins of the world and he is already pursuing his children and ask us to take the mantle responsibility for the lost lambs of God in your family, in the neighborhood and in your workplaces. Would you stand with me? Would you please stand with me? I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you this question. You only answer to Jesus, you don't answer to anybody else, but to the Lord. I would suggest that you would take a minute to really Examine your heart where you are. I'm going to ask you this. What are the godly walls that are broken or not strong in your life today that you want to start rebuilding along with Jesus? I don't think, I don't think these walls are broken. It might not be broken. 
but it can be strengthened what are the walls nehemiah had these three walls in his life his life with the lord his life with one another and his love and responsibility toward the lost for those of you who would say that my wall of intimacy with jesus is not strong as it should be let me tell you god wants intimacy with you he wants to be with you if you like see us i'm not feeling him but no he wants to be with you more than you want to be with him he longs for you to come to him he loves you whatever things that you think in your head let us get rid of it he's a loving father waiting for you to run to him he loves you so deeply so jesus is going to help you as you intentionally make choices to strengthen the wall of intimacy with him for those of you would say that my wall of fellowship with my fellow brother is not as strong as it should be and i want to make intentional choices to love my community that jesus gave me for those of you who would say that i like to see people the same way jesus would see them you know your heart is not burdened for the eternity of others your heart is not burdened seeing the lostness of his children around god you can ask lord would you give me a heart of responsibility that when i look at my neighbor the person whom i work with when i look at them would you help me to see them through your eyes that i will see them not as just people but people with eternity either they will spend with the lord or away from him so i wanted to also encourage you the place that you're working you know ended up there god placed you there if you are if you are a person walking with the lord nothing in our lives happens as an accident you know what that means that means the school that you're going the place that you're working it is all god ordained for two things for his glory and for your good as much as he hates hates it let's ask god to help me to see what god has been doing there and he's going to help you do that see god wants to build his kingdom here in springfield and god wants to use you to do his work here in springfield and all that god will do starts with you isn't it crazy all that god will do in springfield will start with you because you are the one he got here so if i can love him well and if i can love one another well if i can walk around and take responsibility for this city and god is going to show up and he's going to use you for that i'm going to ask you would you come to the altar would you make an altar where you are at you don't have to come up here but you can this is a time with you and jesus that you're really asking him lord would you help me i want to be more close to you i want to love my brother well and i want to feel responsibility in the places that you have placed us so let's go and pray to him father we thank you we thank you lord that you're here we thank you lord for your presence here father we come to you and there are areas in our life that should be strengthened and we acknowledge that today we confess of our sin of not spending time with you but we say that we love you we confess of our sin of not really loving your brother but we say that we live in a community although we confess of our sin of not taking responsibility for what you have done in our lives so would you help us today to be people who love Jesus very well make intentional time to spend with you lord would you help us to do that lord oh lord would you help us to be would you help us to be grateful for the people that you put in our lives today oh lord would you help us to take responsibility today we love you we love you we love you we thank you
is our God. Amen, church? I just want to say I'm feeling blessed this Sunday. You know, that was an amazing message. Thank you for that. The presence of God was here. And I'm looking out there, I'm thinking, well, some of you might be bummed out thinking the best part of my week is over. Sunday service is over. But I've got good news. The presence of God that's here it goes beyond the walls of this church amen we can walk in his presence day in and day out wherever we are now, as our service comes to an end i just want to encourage you seek him now open that door that he's knocking on allow him into the other six days of your week the altar is going to remain open if you need any counseling, if you need any prayer, you're welcome to come up front. There's going to be leaders here that can minister to you, that can fellowship with you. Our church cafe is open. If it's your first time here, you can head over there, get a free cup of coffee. We look forward to meeting the new members. Look forward to including you into our community and making you feel welcome. And be blessed. <laughs>